Hello there, welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another Victorian costuming project today. That's right, it's finally time to make the day bodice for the cicada gown. Of course, last year I made the evening bodice here on the channel. I'll put a card up to that video here. I also made the skirts and a pan fan to match this costume, a bonnet to match this costume, but I can't put it off any longer. It's time to make the day bodice. Where we left off with my bodice pattern, I was having some trouble getting the shoulders and collar to fit perfectly for the high collared day bodice version. So I'll of course have to do some fit fixes first and mess with my mock-up, maybe even make another mock-up. We'll see how it goes before I can cut into my silk. Luckily, I was able to get a few more yards of this Elphaba colored silk from Silk Baron, so I know I won't be running out of fabric today, but for some reason that doesn't make me any less nervous, honestly. Here are some historic examples of Victorian day bodices, bustle gown bodices from the 1880s. To give you an idea of things that were inspiring me as I went ahead and designed this bodice, of course, really, I just fell in love with this costume from Crimson Peak, like many, many other people. And technically this gown is too early for the period of the film and is actually too early for the period of my costume as well. This is a natural form era gown, which is the first um, or like the second bustle period. And my gown is from the third bustle period. Ooh, easy to get all mixed up. Basically the bustle got large, slimmed down again, and then got large again. And I'm, we are here in the third period for this cicada gown costume. So technically this inspiration is too early for my costume as well, but too bad. But here is the actual extant gown that inspired the costume designer for Crimson Peak. Um, so this is the another version of this that's a little bit less goth. But of course, we're still going to be going quite goth here for my version as well. So, you know, it's a disparate selection of inspirations, not all of them historically accurate or of the correct time period. But really, I'm, I'm creating my dream gown not a perfect recreation in any way, you know? But seeing as I still have a few fit issues to work out with this bodice pattern, we better jump on over to the blue patterning table of doom and get started. All right, here we are with my paper pattern and also with the first muslin that I made last year. Of course, you can see me work with this pattern for the first time and make this muslin in this video. I'll put up in a card here. But to go ahead and adjust the fit on the top of the collar area of this, I of course first need to take the collar off of this. So I'm going to play around and fiddle with this muslin to see if I can get this to fit a little bit better up at the top. Um, so I took the collar off. You know how I love seam ripping. But I think I'm just going to try and lower the collar in the center back area and then take in this shoulder seam, seam a little tiny bit because it seems like I just have some excess fabric up here and that's what's causing the bunching at the back of the neck. Um, I feel like if I took a little bit off, it would stop doing that. So let's go ahead and give that a try. Here at the top of the shoulder, I'm just going to kind of ease in a little wedge out of fullness right along the neckline. I'm just drawing that in with my Crayola washable markers. You know, I end up with washable marker all over me when I do pattern drafting down here. And then for the center back, again, I want to take out about a half inch. So I'm just easing that into the rest of the neckline and then taking out a half inch at the center back neck because that's where I seem to have a little bit of bunching that I felt I could get rid of. I guess my neck sits further back than this Victorian pattern suggests it should, but you know, whatever. I will adjust the fabric, for I cannot adjust my body. Tis the way it is. And I'm a slouchy person, which is probably not helping with the whole shoulder fit situation, which I'll talk about a little bit, a little bit more about later. Um, but now that I've made that slight, you know, adjustment of just readjusting, I only adjusted the shoulder seam on one side, by the way, so I could see it and compare it to the original, which was good because I ended up not doing that shoulder adjustment on my pattern, but I did end up liking the way this half inch at the back neck ended up looking. So I forgot to try on this mock-up for you, but again, it would have been very subtle and hard to capture on camera, the difference. So you'll just have to trust me. Weirdly enough, that modification worked. And then here is my design sketch for my day bodice for this cicada gown project. I have sort of a, that spine detailing going down the back. We'll talk more about that later. And then I have like basic, very simple false uh, lapel front on the top of the um, like neckline area. For the front of the bodice, which, you know, the front of this is going to be less epic than the back because the back is going to be getting a lot of attention. But before we can embellish anything, we have to take a new tracing of the pattern to modify as the day bodice one, because of course I don't want to do anything to the original pattern. I want to keep it for the future and to be able to use again and again. So I'm creating a new tracing of that on my alphanumeric paper here, and then I'll do any modifications I need to do to the new pattern as opposed to the original truly Victorian pattern. Again, this is the truly Victorian tailed bodice pattern, by the way, that we're starting off with and making modifications to. And here I am figuring out how I want to shorten the tails in the back because it has this pleated tail section. And I chose the short tail option, but they were not short enough. Either they needed to be much longer or much shorter. So that's what I went with. But I'm just modifying the front kind of um, point on this instead of having it be a 
convex I kind of wanted it to be a concave curve um, so I went ahead and modified that real quickly just using my evening bodice as a guide and I added a um, half inch along the center front of that front piece as well again having learned doing the evening bodice that I needed more of an overlap in the front of this and then I'm just tracing the back here as well including these large sections in the back for where the pleats go just tracing everything including the um, notches or where the notches need to be and then including drawing that neckline in that half inch lower I drew on the original pattern with the pink marker so I would know for the future that I need to lower that a half inch and so after having cut the back pleats to the shape I wanted I went ahead and took apart the pleating to see what I would have to make uh, what changes I would need to make to my actual pattern here so that's how I arrived upon the shape for the back pleated section of this is that I just cut the already pleated muslin and then took the pleats out and saw what it had done to the way the pattern piece looked hopefully that makes some sense it's kind of hard to explain honestly the pleats on this were a little bit frustrating and not my favorite bit so you'll have to forgive me but here I'm just cutting everything out and then I can keep working on the side back and see how that lines up with this center back piece here so this again I need to cut down just a little bit so that it matches up here where these meet at the pleats it's an interesting nonsense and of course it's easier to pleat paper like this so I was giving things a trial run in the paper making sure they matched up I was like how does this actually go together so I grabbed the muslin again because I was like wait what and so I repleated this down just trying to figure out how I ended up with the shape that I ended up with so it seems to be working just draw in my indicators where they need to be and of course all of that will need to be lined somehow back there as well because it will flip up in the wind and things like that and then for my sleeves here I actually used the modified version I traced the modified version that I had created for my evening bodice last year because I had to raise the elbow I think it was raise it or lower it I had to modify the elbow a little bit on this original sleeve pattern but I did want to use the original truly Victorian sleeve pattern um, as a guide for how long to make these sleeves um, so that's what I'm using both the modified and the unmodified sleeve pattern here to make the long sleeve version basically but I wanted my elbow to be in the corrected place. Of course, this is a two-part sleeve. There's an outer sleeve and an inner sleeve, basically. And I wanted to draw the grain line on so I could cut these properly later. All that nonsense. Lots of tracing with my messy hair and Star Wars t-shirts <clears throat> above the blue table of doom here. And I was thinking about doing a cuff on these, but I ended up doing something else instead. So you'll see that when we come, when we come to embellishing the sleeves later. But here I, of course, needed to start cutting everything out. And I have a just a plain muslin here, but it's actually black muslin, which is available from Mood. Perfect. Perfect for what I needed it for. So this is going to be the interlining for my entire bodice. And then, of course, I needed to cut everything out of the green Alphaba silk. The name of this silk is Alphaba. Um, they have fanciful names for the different colors of silk over at Silk Baron, which is where I picked this silk up and where I would like to do a lot of silk shopping were I a gajillionaire, because all of them look stunning, let's be honest. And this silk taffeta is probably the prettiest fabric I've ever worked with, you know? And I'm lucky that I'm to work with it at all. Thank you to my patrons who made this costuming project possible. Um, and because I would never ever have been able to afford this much silk otherwise. And it is a dream come true for me, um, this costume in general, especially the day bodice, for whatever reason, I was more set on having a day costume than an evening one, so. This day bodice really is the culmination of a long, lifelong dream of having a bustle gown, which my patrons made possible. So thank you to all of you. And to all of you who watch as well, because you help me pay for all the trimmings and all that nonsense as well. And help make this my job, so I get to play around making costumings for my job now. So thank you. But of course, I'm just setting up all the grain lines on this. I am cutting this all on the straight grain, which will be important later. I'll talk about that when it comes to embellishing this. Because with the bodice all cut in the straight grain, that leaves the other grains uh, as an, it leaves an opportunity there, let's just say, so we'll get to that later. But of course, the first step before I can start sewing any of these seams together is I have to interline all these pieces, and that requires me laying them all on top of one another, uh, laying the silk pieces on top of their corresponding muslin pieces, I suppose, and then I will just pin within the seam allowance, and then I will hand baste all of these pieces together all around the outside edge of them. So that does take some time, of course. Some nice hand basting needs to happen, though.
So I'll take these over to my desk so I can sit in a comfier chair to do this. I'm just going to take a back stitch at the top uh, or the, at the like starting line is both. And I'm just using a white cotton thread again to do this. I used white to baste and whip stitch everything in my evening bodice as well. It leaves the inside looking rather conspicuous, but I kind of like that every hand stitch can be seen because it takes a long time, you know? If you used, you know, a matching color thread, a lot of this would blend in a lot more. And here I am doing a, a bit of a slower demonstration for you over here on the side back piece on top of my ironing board. So again, I just take a back stitch here at the front. I'm using um, beeswax on this thread as well. So this thread is waxed so it doesn't get tangled on itself every three seconds, which it still wants to do a little bit, but yeah. Um, so taking a back stitch at the start there and then just taking large basting stitches. I'm using a beading needle for this again. Um, just like last time I discovered that it pulls on the silk the least, a like very, very thin, long beading needle. So that's what I ended up using. Contrary to what seems to be popular opinion, I prefer to use long needles. Um, I had some like nicer, brand new, like Belgian or French needles, I can't remember, nice European needles laying around. And I found that they were still like kind of catching on the silk and not going through the silk smoothly. So I switched back over to these beading needles and they seem to work best for me. So, you know, you must do what feels right, of course. So after hours and hours of basting everything together, all my pieces looked like this. <laughs> all along the outside edges of everything, everything is now interlined. But of course, I went ahead and basted the front edges of my pieces as well, which I didn't need to do. The very front pieces, the very front opening uh, area actually is lined as normal. So uh, right sides together and sewn together. And then the rest of it is basted for the interlining of this. So I went ahead and did that, took out my basting and lined these properly. So you can see the front edge of this is now finished. I need to go ahead and transfer my darts onto here. So I'm using some of my clover tracing paper. I'm just layering that between the pattern and the back here. And I take this little tracing wheel and trace my darts onto the fronts. Can't get away from darts. No matter if I'm sewing 1950s things, 1940s things, or 1880s things, I'm always sewing some darts. So now that those are marked, I'm going to go ahead and pin the two layers together along the inside of those and actually baste that area down as well, because I don't want these layers to separate or move apart at all when I'm sewing the darts. So I'm just going to go ahead and throw a little bit of basting in the dart fullness here, just so that things stay together nicely and will lay smooth. Then I can go ahead and pin my darts together here. I'm just taking my time to make sure I have the darts lined up properly, that when I pin on one side, it's lining up with the other. So you see me redo it a, little, a few times here, just making sure I have this right so that my darts end up the right size and shape in the end. And I'm, I already have pinned the other side you can see there. I'm just pinning these one at a time instead of trying to pin both darts. I'm just doing one, sewing that, then coming back over and pinning the other and sewing that. Here on the lovely Singer 99K from 1955, which is still not that different from her predecessors that would have been used to sew a gown like this. Of course, back then it would have been foot pedal or hand crank or something. But mine has a, or not foot pedal, pedal, uh, like a treadle machine, sorry. Treadle, not pedal. This machine, however, from 1955, does have an electric motor and an electric light and uh, can do a back stitch. So all those modern conveniences, but um, it's not too different, again, from its ancestors that would have been used to sew a dress like this. But I have this set on a small stitch length, uh, 12 stitches per inch, I believe. And then I have cotton Guterman thread in here, both on the top and on the bobbin. And after my darts are sewn, I can take them over here to the ironing board and I'm going to cut up the dart fullness here and kind of cut these open so that I can press them out flat. Like so. Go ahead and give those a quick press. And then I will go ahead and whip stitch the edges of this. Um, sometimes you'll see seams and darts bound in like a silk binding um, or whip stitched or stitched down even to the interlining. I'm just going to go ahead and whip stitch the edges here with more waxed cotton thread. Um, last time when I did this, people were like, you don't need to make your stitches so close together. And so I have listened and I'm spacing them out a little bit more, especially because how finely bound does this seam need to be when again, I'm not going to be wearing my day bodice on the daily. And therefore the chance of these things fraying is much slimmer when owned by me, because sadly I don't wear a Victorian dress very often. So, you know, this will be, have been the first time, but I'm just whip stitching the raw edges together just by themselves 
all the way along this um, dark fullness that's been pressed open to be kind of like a seam now. I have seen Victorian bodice patterns where the darts are sewn like as a seam as opposed to as darts, but I prefer to do it this way. And then I went ahead and just jumped back on over to the Blue Table of Doom to cut out some lining for the back pleated areas. So that's just what I'm doing here because those are going to be self-lined in this taffeta. We'll get to that eventually. So over here I can start sewing my pieces together since everything is basted and prepped. So I can go ahead and sew my center, like one of my center backs here onto a side back. So that's where you start. I think you sew the center back itself last, oddly enough. I think those are part of the truly Victorian directions if I'm remembering correctly. And I was fully willing to follow them, so why not? Um, but down here, you have to actually stitch a half inch below into this pleat extension. So I'm just marking that with a colored pencil so I won't forget when I'm sewing this. And I like having my concave piece on top of the convex piece when sewing princess seam lines. And yes, after, you know, a year of being confused of which is concave and which is convex, I think I finally have it. You can let me know if I've got it mixed up, honestly. So here I am sewing the seam that I was just pinning over here. I am sewing over my fine silk pins. If you're new here, welcome. I sew over pins. You'll have to either forgive me or um, seethe, either way. Um, and I've clipped the waist seam here so that I can press this open. But the rest of this above the waist, I'm just going to press the, all of the seam allowance towards the center back like this. And then I will go ahead and whip stitch that raw edge as well. And wouldn't you know, one of you marvelous people out there bought me a clapper. So that's right, I actually have a proper clapper now and I don't have to use my hands all the time. The only thing is I just have to get used to using the clapper because I forget it's there and keep using my hands. But you know, I, I will adjust. So thank you for investing in a clapper for me, seeing as I was apparently loath to do so myself. And I will go ahead and pin the sections of like the skirted, like pepple me bit together and sew that down as well. So I can start thinking about how these pleats go together back here looks much better in silk than it did in paper earlier, but it's still going to be a bit of a conundrum figuring out how to do this pleated stuff down here. But next I can sew the side piece onto the side back there, so moving, making my way forward around the body of the bodice. So I can go ahead and sew that side piece on and just basically I'm sewing each seam like so and then cutting the or clipping the curves, pressing it open, whip stitching each side and then I will sew the next seam. So I'm doing um, it kind of is nice because it breaks up the hand sewing, hands uh, whip stitching. Like if I sewed everything and then whip stitch everything, it'd be a lot of whip stitching to do at once. And that's a lot of hand sewing for me. I mean, this in general is a lot of hand sewing for me. But then finally I can sew my fronts onto the sides here and we will have two sides of bodices. You can see how on the other piece the seams are whip stitched. Sorry if you hear any noise going on in the background as usual. Uh, as I always say, I, I do not live alone, and therefore we are in the basement and people are doing all kinds of nonsense upstairs because uh, I don't have one of those, like, I need like a light somewhere that says like, recording, <laughs> so that people know not to be like, I don't know, building bookcases or whatever the heck they're doing up there. Who knows? All right, so now I have my center back seam sewn and I can figure out this pleat situ situation um, because it's just... Like, looks like a bunch of lettuce back here, honestly. So here's the lining I cut out earlier for those back two pieces. I'm going to sew that together and basically bag line this back, like anything below the waist, <laughs> the back pleated section. I'm pinning this lining to the right side of the, I guess, fashion fabric. And I will just go ahead and totally bag line this like skirt peplum extension area. Cut off a little bit of excess fabric that I ended up with. Just gonna go ahead and sew that on. Um, again, just half inch seam allowances. When I reach a point, I'll leave the needle down, pick the presser foot up so I can turn the project, put the presser foot back down, and then keep going. Give them lots of corners and um, like very acute corners and curves on this. Again, this really looks like a mess of silk lettuce or something. It's not the most fun part. Again, the pleats are not the fun part. <laughs> I'm warning you now. Although if you have, if this is the fun part for you, good for you, but I found it. A little bit annoying to try and wrangle. My favorite part, of course, of any costuming project is the embellishing at the end. Hmm. I suppose that makes me more of a milliner than a mantua maker. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying. Here I am clipping my curves and clipping my corners off so that I can go ahead and turn this, press this all into the inside, and then figure out how to pleat it down. Hmm. I have a knitting needle also around to help me poke out these corners and such. You can see I'm clipping excess out around the curves. And then I've turned it all up to the inside and pressed it down. And now I have to figure out how do these pleats go again? 
<laughs> there, there's, there is a pleating diagram or like guide in the truly Victorian pattern that I was loosely following and referencing here. I don't think my pleats are completely, you know, even uh, in general, but it's going to give the correct look. It will be fine. So once that is all pleated down, it looks like this. Of course, the top edges of all this are still raw and will need to be contained somehow. Um, I wouldn't be surprised in the Victorian era if they just left them raw. Um, and here again is the pleating pattern from the truly Victorian pattern. Um, so this is how it's supposed to be pleated, and mine is essentially like this. It's just maybe, you know, one side is two inches, and the other side is an inch and a half. Eh, things like that. But it's time now, before we can figure out what to do about those back pleats, to bone this entire bodice. You heard me. And I'm actually going to be using the same plastic boning that I used for the evening bodice. I actually, as much as I ragged on this boning for being modern and strange in my other videos, I really liked using it. It worked well. I found it easy to use, and it worked well for the purpose I needed it for. So we're just going to keep using it. Is it completely historically accurate? Absolutely not. Does it work? And is it cheap? Yes. So we're going to keep using that. I'm just whip stitching a piece of boning down on top of every single seam inside, except for the curved back side back seams. A lot of times you will see on Victorian bodices that those curved seams were boned. They usually used spi uh, spiral spun steel, um, spiral steel boning, like for corsetry, for those back bones because it curves nicely. Um, or often I've heard it said that that is what was used. But those are like the, that's like the only seam that doesn't actually totally require boning, so I don't worry about it. But for every other seam, I'm stitching a piece of boning to the seam allowances and I'm just whip stitching this on. Sometimes you will see boning sewn on very loosely inside of these. Like you'll see it only has like 10 stitches up a bone to hold it in place. So clearly sewing it on this securely actually isn't essential, but it feels weird to me to have anything sewn on that loose. So I'm sewing it down quite securely in here. This is another thing that'll take like half a day just to do all the boning on the inside. But once that was done, I could go ahead and get back to finishing that bottom edge, figuring out the pleats, um, how to finish the top of the pleats and the rest of the bottom of the bodice. I'm just going to go ahead and use some two inch wide double fold bias tape that I'm making out of the same fabric here. So this is just cut on the 45 degree angle to um, true bias, I suppose. And it's just two inches wide strips here that I'm going to use. I'm, um, I'm pinning this onto the outside edge of the bottom edge of the bodice. Hopefully that makes sense or at least you can just see what I'm doing, um, just to finish that bottom edge here. Because of course the pleats in the back are lined, but the rest of this is still raw. So we will go ahead and finish it with this bias. By turning the bias onto the inside, you could also bind this with bias too if you wanted to. If you wanted to have like a binding kind of look as opposed to a kind of clean finish look that we'll be going for here today. But here I'm just sewing half inch seam allowance as usual, sewing that bias tape onto the outside, and then we will turn it onto the inside. So I have left part of that side area of the pleating open and I'll have to slip stitch that shut. But I did so so that I could tuck this in like so down here and create everything. Everything in here will be actually quite cleanly finished, but the stitching will be visible, which uh, is, you know, a theme for the inside of this bodice in general is the stitching is visible. So no big trouble there. I kind of like the way that edges look when they're felled down. It, it feels historical somehow. All right. It's so just folding over the top edge of that at the very front here. Again, just going to be sewing, uh, like felling down the top folded edge of this bias tape to the in interlining. So I'm not stitching all the way through the bodice. I'm just stitching this down to the interlining to hold it in place. So stitch all along here. And then the top of the pleats, I'm really just like adding big, thick whip stitches to hold the top of the pleats together and then tacking them down to like the seam allowances where I can and to the interlining where I have to. And then everything gets kind of turned down and felled and hemmed as much as I possibly can. Um, I could have given myself a little bit more room with the center back lining piece and then I would have had more room to work with, but I just ended up taking extra pieces of the bias and creating like little patches to cover any raw areas down here, which you will see in a moment. But I'm just felling or slip stitching as needed down here to make sure everything is contained and nice and finished. Of course, what is most important here is that it looks nice on the outside, not necessarily that it looks perfect on the inside. Um, and if you look at extant Victorian bodices, which, side note, pet peeve, um, you can look at the inside of garments, usually 
from ones that have been sold on eBay or Etsy over the years. Um, so usually the images you find on Pinterest of like the insides of garments were taken by sellers, um, antique dealers and stuff like that before they sold a garment because they like to post pictures of everything including the inside. Whereas museums, for some reason, do not take pictures of the inside of the garments, which if we are keeping the garments as like a historic relic, half the information or more is on the inside. So why, for example, the Metropolitan Museum has images of the outside, but not the inside? Listen, I know it's a big, it's a big task to take to photograph an entire collection like that anyway, so I'm happy to have any photos at all. But like one or two of the inside of a bodice sometimes, would it hurt you? You could do it. Come on. It's very rare that a museum has pictures of the inside. They need to help me out. Anyway, here where I left that opening, I'm going to go ahead and slip stitch the uh, lining of the like drape or side point to it, its lining. Hmm, hopefully that makes sense. The lining to the outside is what I mean to say. So slip stitch this area so that it is invisible up to where the binding is. And then again, I will just fell the top of the binding edge down to the interlining and to the boning area up here, just to anchor all everything all in place. And then the bottom edge of my bodice will be finished. Woohoo! Isn't that nice? The goal here is to, you know, finish the entire bodice itself, and then we can start embellishing. For we have a lot of embellishing to be done. And, you know, with Victorian things, you really can go to town with embellishment if you should, if you should so desire. Um, more lace, cording, soutache, uh, beading even. There's lots of options. Check out fashion plates um, or a good resource to see different designs. But here's how this ended up looking on the inside in the end. I have these little patches fell down to cover any raw edges. I think that works. It, um, you can see actually how the very center back of that lining is cut on the cross grain as well. We'll be talking about that more in a moment. But I'm going to start working on the collar and the sleeves now. So I just was pinning the collar to its lining, set that over by the machine, and then I can start pinning the sleeves together as well. So the sleeves again are a two-part sleeve. There's an outer and an inner sleeve. And you can see I actually pre-whipped the uh, raw edges of this. So I don't know uh, like the pros and cons of whipping the raw edges before or after you sew things together. Obviously, when I'm normally I'm sewing, I serge all the edges before I sew things together. So it's not something I'm adverse to. But for the sleeves, it just seemed easier to whip stitch them before I sewed them together. So that's what I ended up doing. But I'm just sewing this with my half inch seam allowance again, both the outer seam and the inner seam for each sleeve. And then sewing my collar together as well. I'm starting about a half inch in, um, so I'm leaving a half inch free along where it will be sewn to the bodice, and you will see how that comes in handy later. So I'm not sewing all the way to the edge with this. Just to give myself a little bit of maneuverability in the end. Again, leave the needle down, pick the press up, turn, put the press back down. How I get around corners. I'm going to take a little bit more of that bias cut out of the silk to go ahead and hem the ends of my sleeves as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and do this real fast here. Again, I'm putting that on the outside, or right sides together, I suppose, along the outside, and I will stitch that down half inch seam allowance again, as always. And then I will turn this to the inside and I will fell the edge of the bias tape again to the interlining once again. Similar step or same technique, different area. This little cuff here is just big enough to fit over my hand. Uh, any any slimmer and I would have needed to have like buttons at the cuff but luckily this just slips over my hand the end of my like the um below my knuckles of my hand I feel like my hand doesn't bend quite as much as normal uh, like uh, average I suppose and like the width of my hand at the base of my fingers is quite wide so I can't wear bangles most of the time if you're ever wondering why I don't of all the vintage things to collect I don't collect vintage uh, Bakelite bangles um, and it's because I can't get them on to my wrist Anything that's like a clamp bracelet, fine. Or something with a clasp, but any bangle or like a rigid bracelet, I can't slip them over my hand usually, so they are not for me. But here you can see I'm just stitching, felling down the edge of the bias tape to the interlining of the bottom of the sleeve here. No stitches will show on the outside. And with my sleeves otherwise completed, I can go ahead and put a line of stitching across the top here for gathering those down because this pattern for whatever reason has a gathered sleeve gap although it seems 
that was much more of a later 1880s thing into the 1890s, of course, because that's when sleeves get giant. But, um, whatever. We'll go with it. <laughs> it's easier to do a puff sleeve than it is to do a perfectly set in sleeve anyway, so we'll do it. And here I am just... I've clipped the curves and the corners of my collar, and I'm just ironing that into place. But before I can put the collar or the sleeves in, I have to show, sew my shoulder seams together on the bodice because I haven't done that yet. I think it recommends doing this before you bone the bodice, but like, why? It's much easier to bone it all flat and then sew the shoulder seams together. So that is what I've done here. And again, I will press this open and whip stitch either side of this area as well. So much seam finishing to be done for this nonsense. <laughs> all by hand. You can see why I'm saving time by sewing over those pins. And again, the needle is stronger than those pins are, so the needle will win that argument. The pen will just bend, and that's fine. But if, you're, if you've been here a while, you know my feelings on sewing over pins. <laughs> but here I am pressing that seam allowance open so I can whip stitch the seam allowance like so, like a magic. If only it were really as easy as a scene transition. <clears throat> Not so much. But now I can go ahead and turn this over so that I can sew my collar on to the outside edge of this. All right, get this in position. Find the back of my collar. I am just pinning the outside of the collar to the bodice and I'm leaving the lining of the collar free because I will use that later to tuck all the seam allowance up into the collar and finish this cleanly along the inside. So you'll see that in a moment. So I'm just sewing the outer layers here and you can see my collar is a lot shorter than the front of my bodice because I extended the bodice by a half inch but I didn't make the collar any longer. Hmm. Probably should have made the collar a little bit longer there, but how I will solve that is by turning the top edge of the bodice over twice and then felling it down. So you'll see that in a moment as well. I'm just gonna go ahead and stitch my collar onto here. Um, the collar issue in the back was solved by that one fit adjustment I did, with lowering the back neckline a little bit, but something I didn't know about truly Victorian patterns, which seems to be kind of a known issue because I saw it mentioned in a couple of blog posts while researching how these things go together on other people's blogs because Many have come before us when it comes to sewing Victorian patterns, um, or truly Victorian patterns. But something I didn't know was that it's kind of a known issue with their patterns that the front comes to a bit of a V as opposed to perfectly curved. Um, so that is something I will have to fix in the future if I ever make anything from this pattern or will want to double check on the mock-ups from now on because it's something I didn't notice in the mock-up for this bodice was that the front, it's just like a little bit of excess space where it front overlaps in the very very front and it comes to a bit of a v as opposed to fully curved so i'll have to fix that in the future um i don't think it's that noticeable in this bodice in the end don't tell me if you think it's terrible <clears throat> i think it's fine i think especially with a collar like a brooch or something which we'll talk about soon i think it'll be okay but here i'm just turning everything onto the inside and folding it up into the lining of the collar i did have to clip that curve a little bit here so i can get this all to lay flat so i've just tucked up all the seam allowance into the collar itself. You can see again that front edge, the very top past my collar area, I have it turned over twice and I'll just fill that down to the inner lining again. When, you know, in doubt, turn it cleanly and fill it to the inner lining. This seems to be my order of operations here. I was just seeing if this was gonna lay okay. Seems all right. Um, funny enough, this collar seems actually a little bit slim also for Victorian collars. A lot of times it seems that they had ones that are a bit taller than this too, which might be a bit more fun and exaggerated for next time. I'm just going to come in here and again, fell down the folded edge to the interlining. How many times will I say that in this video? A great many. All right, so now back to these sleeves. I was kind of like switching back and forth between the collar and the sleeves here. I'm going to go ahead and pull my gathering threads down and fit the sleeve into the armhole. Now, of course, my camera cut out at this time for some reason, but really, you're just watching me struggle to fit that down in there. And is it that is that very fun to watch? No. I have no tips for you other than deep breaths and patience. Um, but here I am setting my sleeve into the bodice itself. It's all pinned, of course, in place, and I have no shame about sewing over my pin, so it is held in place nicely for me. Um, but I do have my hand, again, in between the bodice and the sleeve inside there just to make sure that nothing is getting caught that isn't supposed to be, nothing is bunching up that isn't supposed to be gathered, you know, things like that. So I like to keep one hand inside the project while I'm doing this and the other, my right hand is guiding it through the presser foot, just to make sure nothing extra is being caught. And I start and stop a lot, you'll notice here, you know, I sew a couple of inches, readjust everything. Um, sew a couple of inches, readjust everything. Make sure nothing wonka doodle is happening here because we don't want strange, we don't want to have to do this again, you know? 
you want to set in your sleeve once and be done with it. Um, so it's important to make sure you have the correct sleeve, the right or the left sleeve, pinned in before you do it. Double, triple check everything, you know? And then just take your time, do as little progress as you want, use as much time as you want to sew a sleeve in there, you know? But now that both of my sleeves are in here, I can go ahead and that's right, whip stitch <laughs> this raw seam. So I'm just going to grab more of my cotton thread here and whip stitch both of my arm size as well. I did actually end up making little dress shields out of muslin to go in here as well. I'm sorry I did not get that on camera. I was actually, I sewed them into the underarms while we were driving to the photo shoot location where I ended up taking pictures of this costume. So um, I did that extremely last minute, but I just cut two little round-ish um, shapes of muslin and then tacked them down here along the underarm of the seam. But then it was time to sew on the front closure for this bodice before we were nearly done here. Um, and every inch along the front of this, I'm going to sew a hook and eye. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm going to sew a button over the hooks so it will look like it buttons down the front, but I just couldn't bring myself to sew 19 buttonholes and hope that they all turned out okay. That that seems like a high risk endeavor. So again, just like the evening bodice, I have gone with hooks and eyes here and I'm sewing 19 hooks, one every inch down the front of this bodice. So the hooks I'm sewing all the way through to the outside. I'm not sewing these just to the inch lining because that will pull really funny. So I'm sewing to both layers, all these hooks, but on the other side, you won't see the stitching because I'm gonna sew a button on over it. In fact, I'm not only gonna sew a button on over it, I'm going to kind of satin stitch embroider a false buttonhole behind each button so that it almost looks like I have buttonholes there, but without actually having to do them. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, if you're bothering to sew a false buttonhole, you might as well just stitch a real buttonhole. But the thing about a false buttonhole is you don't have to put a little slice into your silk project like you do with a real buttonhole. And I just don't trust it, you know? Cutting into the project when you're this close to being done and have already worked on it for days just feels wrong. So, you know, there was plenty of bodices that closed with hook and eyes back in the day. It's perfectly accurate for it to close with hook and eyes, so why not? Here I am just kind of satin stitching a false buttonhole on top of the stitching for the hooks, and then I will sew my antique buttons on. You can still get antique Victorian buttons, which is nice. A lot of garments have disintegrated over the years, but people held on to the buttons, obviously, because they're perfectly reusable. So these are Victorian buttons that I'm using on here, so that's nice. But 19 hooks and 19 false buttonholes and 19 buttons later, I had to sew the eyes onto the other side. I actually didn't use hooks and eyes, I used hooks and bars for this because the front overlaps a little bit so it was better to use little bars instead of eyes. Usually hooks and eyes kits come with both, by the way. Um, and sewing on the hooks, eyes, and the buttons did take a full day for this project, that's right. But here I am tracing on a sort of kidney bean shaped situation over my front pattern piece. And this is so I can create some pads to go inside above the bust, between the bust and the shoulder. If you have a Victorian corset on, it kind of pushes the bust up and creates a little bit of a shelf between the bust and the shoulder line. And that hollow needs to be filled out with a little bit of padding, or at least in my case it does. Um, of course, this depends on the size of the bust and the corset in question. But for me, I wanted to have a little bit of padding in here. This is something that was done in ext extant garments to give the proper shape over the, from like the shoulder to the waistline, the proper curve. It wasn't that kind of pigeon breasted shape that you get later in the Victorian era yet, but it was supposed to be kind of a smooth line. And without padding in here, the bodice just kind of has wrinkles in this area where it's trying to go over that hollow space between the bust and the shoulder. So I wanted to fill that in with these little funny little pads. I'm just grabbing some kind of like polyfill batting here because it's what I had in stock. Um, obviously I would have liked to have used cotton or wool batting, but I didn't have any of that kind of thing around because I don't do any quilting, sadly. Um, so I just had this random polyfill. It was what I had on hand, and so that's what I ended up using for this. So my to have padding is historically accurate. My padding itself is not. But I'm just layering that batting in between two layers, again, of the same black muslin that I used to interline the garment. I'm just throwing a few pins in here, and then I'm just actually going to surge around this outside edge. Um, just for a fast way to do these little pads because I didn't care how accurate the, the padding was. Again, choose where to be historically accurate, you know? I will have actual antique buttons, but I'm gonna surge the, ed the edges of the padding, you know? So these just go up here inside the top of the bodice, again, kind of above the ends of the darts. 
between the bust and the shoulder line. I'm going to just do a couple of tailor's tacks, like loose stitches that hold like the top, the bottom, and the two sides of this to the interlining. Again, only stitching through the interlining here so that no stitches are visible on the outside. So I'm just doing a couple of quick little stitches just to the interlining to hold this in place. And with that, the bodice itself is technically finished. But of course, it's time to embellish, you know, the whole thing. So we have our false lapels to do in front. I have a little sort of faux cuff embellishment to do on the sleeve. And then we have our spine detailing like this extant example to do down the back. Now, when I first decided I did want to use this detail down the back of my dress, this was back when I was making the petticoat for this project, way back last year, I decided to go ahead and trial using a cicada motif as opposed to the diamond motif that is used, or like the kind of um, bow tie shape motif that is used on the actual extant dress. And I discovered that, you know, it was possible to use cicadas instead. And as it says here from my Instagram post, it says, looks like this would be a nightmare to try and do in the silk taffeta, but just imagine. And we're about to not have to imagine. We're, we're gonna go ahead and try and do it today. Um, I'm gonna show you how I would do this in muslin first. This is another trial run that I did before trying to do this actually for the real bodice in the real silk. And this is a more bat wing shaped design, of course, which I would love to do like maybe a black and red or like a black or purple dress using the bat wings down the back instead. And you'll see how these bat wings can make really pretty bows for the front too. I'll show you that in just a moment. But you know, tips for this in general to do these little shapes, almost like self finished, uh, like self lined appliques kind of, um, I find it much easier to sew, like trace the design you want onto a rectangle of fabric and then sew around the design and then cut it out afterwards. So instead of trying to sew around like a tiny fiddly bat wing or cicada, it's much easier to sew on a rectangle like this and then cut them out afterwards. So that's what I'm gonna do here for this example and also for the cicadas today. But I'm just stitching with a very small stitch length. I'm down to like 15 stitches per inch. Of course, my machine goes even smaller than that, which is mad to me. Um, but so after I have sewn them, I will cut them out like this and then turn them right sides out. I'm cutting this with like an eighth of an inch seam allowance left, and I'm still clipping my curves and cutting my corners though, so that everything will lay nice and flat when I turn them right side out. I'm gonna go ahead and do that again with the aid of a knitting needle here. Just turn everything right side out and give it a nice good press. So once I have two of these little bat wings, we can start to see what that would look like down the back of a bodice. And we can loop a ribbon through those, show you how this is done in effect. So we have, the extent example has like bow ties down the back and a bow tie shape isn't that different from a bat wing shape is what I was thinking here, you know? So we have like say a ribbon of silk kind of gathered at the top there and then we can loop it around the centers of these. So we have this kind of knot um, or turn of the fabric across the bat itself, like across the bow tie. And then we have like a uh, plain loop in between. So that's one way to do this. Um, you can also do it so that the turn is in between the motifs, um, which I'll show you that as well. I was grabbing a piece of tape here, um, cotton tool tape. Um, so if you connect these actually with a ribbon, like so, then you can actually turn this so that the twist is between the motifs. So hopefully you can see that now. And then the longer twist is like across the bat itself. Um, and now I was thinking while I was editing this, how fun would it be to do the ribbon down the center of the bats as like a really fuzzy velvet and then do the bat wings themselves in like sheer silk organza so that it looked like a fuzzy bat body was like the velvet and then the wings were sheer. Not that I need, you know, more projects, <laughs> but could be quite fun. And then uh, these little bows actually, or uh, bats, look almost like bows once you start playing with them. So if you imagine this down the center front of a bodice, so imagine like instead of like a frog closure or a button, if you had this almost as a closure, it was reminding me of this style of Victorian uniform, um, which I think is a English military uniform from the Victorian era, not sure exactly when. My military history is non-existent. Um, but I was thinking like you could have these and you could either have them hang loose like that military ribbon does, you could tie them in a bow, you could like hook them, you could have buttons on either end of the wings. There's so many different options you could do with this. So I'm definitely going to be returning and revisiting these bats sometime because like look how cute that would be down the center front of a bodice or even down the back even as well. So 
We'll be returning to this bat situation sometime, but of course today we're going to be using a cicada shape instead. So I was playing with all different kinds of shapes here, and really what I was just, you know, just drawing and playing around with some construction paper to create these motifs and do my trial versions here, including some vertebrae shaped ones, because I think that would be really pretty. Imagine in an ivory silk, like an ivory silk bustle gown, wedding gown, but like the back has this like spine detail down the back with actual vertebrae applique. How pretty would that be? An all ivory silk. So it would like look really pretty from far away, but when you got close, you could see it was just a little bit creepy. Oh, it does sound lovely. But today we're going to be using these cicada-shaped uh, motifs down the back of this. And I was trying to decide, you know, what I wanted to do. Um, I did want to grade, grade aid, grade aid, grade aid, eh, whatever. I wanted to grade the sizes down um, so that I would have larger cicada at the top and smaller ones down at the waist. Again, this also helps with the illusion of making the waist look smaller, which is always nice, especially with Victorian costuming, where that is quite a feature of the whole thing but I was just creating different shapes here. And of course I didn't want to go too small here because to turn them right side out would be very, very irritating. <laughs> so um, this one I'm drawing right now is going to be the smallest cicada. And I was like, I can't go smaller than this. So I ended up making one larger at the top so that I could keep this one as the smallest one because come on, how fiddly do we want these things to be for myself? I, I already knew it was gonna be kind of a task to create these little appliques in the taffeta to begin with, let alone to do them even smaller. So we'll move that one down to be the smallest size down here at the waist. Actually trimmed a little bit off the wings and I decided to pick the side I liked best. I cut cut the little dude down the middle and then I traced a new one down a center line so that both sides would be the same. That's kind of how I went about creating these templates. But of course you could do all kinds of different motifs down the back and use this same sort of spiraling, almost like exterior spine detail down the middle of them, but you could do this with butterflies or moths or bats like before, or even like doves would be very pretty. Um, you could use all kinds of different motifs. Like you could use real feathers on the doves and that, or like on the birds, <sighs> it'd be very pretty. Or like have it be owls or ravens or anything with wings down the back like this would be really fun. And then again, you could start getting into like more skeletal designs, like using actual vertebrae or different, you know, dragonflies would be pretty as well, like on an iridescent silk. So I think this idea has, uh, has like cicada, has legs, you know, you can go quite far with it. I definitely want to use the bats, kind of bat wing idea in the future. So I make one more that's a little bit larger, I think. And then I don't have to make any smaller. Ooh, because any smaller than that last one. I don't know. Okay, so you can see from my little silk sample one here, we're going to use that as a bit of a demonstration here. I'm going to go ahead and slice off, this is a nice good uh, scrap of silk here that was nice and long, so I'm going to use that to create the ribbon to go down the center of these later. So I'm just tearing that off so I have a straight piece here to be the ribbon that goes winding around all these friends later. Um, so I have that that I can go ahead and set aside. But this little silk cicada that was like my practice one here, I'm going to take over to the back of the bodice and show you um, how I went about cutting these and why I did. So if we have this little silk friend and we have our silk bodice and we set that down, we can see it blends in really well because this is cut along the straight grain and so is the bodice. But if, for example, we cut our embellishments on the cross grain, they tend to stand out against the straight grain. So the light hits the grain of the fabric differently. This is why you have to be careful when cutting out the bodice that you cut it all on the same grain. You cut everything on the straight grain so it doesn't look mispieced in the end, because when you turn things like this, you can see the light hits them completely differently. But because I want my embellishments to stand out a little bit, I will go ahead and cut them on the cross grain on purpose. So I'm going to trace all these little guys onto cross grain pieces of spare silk. Of course, I have all these little bits of silk from cutting out the rest of the projects. So I'm just using up my spare pieces here, which is nice because it means nothing's going to waste really. And again, I'm just tracing along the outsides of my templates here onto rectangular pieces, and then I will stitch around the shape and then cut them out afterwards. I'm just gonna stick a few pins in here so the layers of silk don't move around too much. Of course, I do have two layers of silk here. 
so I can create these little embellishments. Another idea I was having with this too is because you're creating these little pillows almost, you could stuff them. So if you had like cotton or wool, you could like stuff these so that they were like quilted and padded as well, which would be a fun way to do this. So many options. <laughs> But here I am stitching all along the outside of my cicadas using, again, a tiny stitch length and just taking my time to really copy the shape exactly following over that colored pencil line. And I do have to leave a little bit of space, so I have space to turn this right side out in the end. Um, but I decided to choose a more straight area of the top of the wing for that. So I'm just finishing off this curve down here. And I can go ahead and trim the outside of this. So you can see kind of why I left the muslin test version of showing you how to do this in, because it's a little bit harder to see what's going on in the silk. But again, I'm just clipping my corners and curves, and then I can go ahead and turn this right side out. Again, with the aid of a knitting needle here. Just helps get everything nice and smooth and turned out properly. Um, I didn't clip the curves along the inside of this because I was like, ah, it'll be covered by the ribbon anyway. But then I ended up opening it back up and clipping those curves in there because it was bothering me how wrinkled it was in there. Um, so I went in here and I clipped the curves properly. Always clip your curves, you know, unless I tell you not to. <clears throat> I can go ahead and clip those curves so this will lay even nice and flatter. And that was one cicada done, four more to go. So I have sewn all of those and I can go ahead and trim and clip and turn all the rest of these. You can see why this was a nine day project for me. <laughs> all right, so now I have all my cicadas finished and lined up down the center back of my bodice here. And they already look quite pretty on their own, don't they? I think so. Um, so I've just pinned these down the center and then I'm pinning them, uh, putting a pin in about one inch out from the center back on either side of these. And I'm just eyeballing the spacing of these and all that stuff. By the way, I'm not measuring it because if it turned out a little bit organic and asymmetric, I wasn't going to be too fussed about it because um, this is the most symmetrical part of this costume so far because the rest of this costume's design is very asymmetric. So if this came out looking a little bit more naturalistic, I didn't mind. But here I am trialing the ribbon down the um, center of these. And I'm using, you know, a piece of fabric that I have turned and uh, turned into like a tube to create a ribbon for this. But in the end, I decided that this was actually just too thick and bulky with the two layer tube like this. I don't know. I was just thinking, eh, it's not looking exactly like I would like. It looks fine, but it's just not as delicate of puffs, I guess, as I was after. So I switched over to a single layer of silk, and this is just a piece of silk about four inches wide that I have torn off the main body of the fabric. And I just like the single layer, the look of the single layer better. So I'm just looping it through each of my cicadas here to get a look at what this is going to look like in the end. And I'm immediately thinking, ah, yes, I like this single layer better. I don't know, the crispness of the taffeta all on its own in a single layer like this. There's just something, there's just something about it, you know? just trialing this all the way down the back here. I'm starting to think about how do I want to sew these cicadas down to the bodice itself? I was originally thinking of sewing them down flat and smooth completely, but then I had another idea to add even more texture back here um, beyond these little beads that I'm adding now. So I decided to sew this down right where I had those pins an inch out from the center back, which they are still, I've measured it now, however, <laughs> an inch out from the center back. I'll put a couple of back stitches through all the layers through the cicada into the bodice to secure the little cicada on. And then I would sew a little beaded bug on top of that, a little beaded version of a cicada, using black glass beads to emulate jet beads, which would have been used on um, Victorian dresses, including day wear at the time, um, often for evening wear as well. But, you know, there was a lot of morning fashion going on, so there's a lot of black beads on Victorian stuff, including day wear, so I felt free to use them. And again, historical accuracy, we're making a nod to historical accuracy, but we're not trying to be, we're not adhering to any rules. 
Um, but I'm just sewing on these little black beads to catch the light down here, down the spine. I think it will be fun in the end. It was just a different way of attaching these on so that we didn't have to see any stitches. But I could retain the free texture of these being like kind of floating above the surface of the back of the bodice. So they are attached, but not attached, you know? You'll see why I left these free floating in just a minute. Again, I am using um, a beading needle for this to stitch these on, because of course a beading needle is best for beading. And then I'm using black silk Guterman thread for this. For all the finishing, actually all the felling I've been doing uh, all along here, I had black silk thread sitting on my desk, so I used that for a lot of the like tailor's tacks and uh, felling little bits down or beading anything, because it was just sitting here on my desk and I figured I might as well use the black silk thread it's a little bit stronger than the cotton thread because silk is strong. And then here is why I did not applique these down. Because I figured, what if I added even more of like a um, rib cage kind of spine-like texture down the back of this by floofing up the wings like this. So I am, again, just eyeballing this and uh, pushing the wings up to create these little curves and even more texture down the back of this. And the larger wings got two valleys or like hills put in and the smaller wings just got the one. So I'm putting tiny, 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 like two tiny stitches that are barely visible because um, I want them to be quite invisible to hold these in place, by the way. So wherever I have it pinned, I'm just putting tiny, tiny stitches with that silk thread again to hold that down. And then finally, with my cicadas attached, I could loop the ribbon through properly this time. And then um, I just gathered it at the top and bottom and stitched the top and bottom of the ribbon down because otherwise it's held in place by the cicadas themselves, of course. And then oftentimes on Victorian day wear garments, there was an additional like layer of collar and cuffs added out of linen or cotton that could be removed and laundered. Because of course, the rest of your dress is over undergarments and doesn't touch your skin or like the oils of your skin or anything like that often, if at all. And therefore garments didn't have to be laundered much, um, if at all, honestly, especially silk garments, they weren't really laundered. You know, you had a lot of underwear that got laundered instead. But of course the collar and cuffs came into contact with the skin. So it was good to have a little layer that was removable and washable near that. And But instead of using a like ivory linen like would have been used at the time, I'm gonna go ahead and use black silk taffeta for my additional collar here today. So just cut that out of the black silk in two layers here. I've actually just peaked the top of the back of the collar up a little bit and then made the collar a full half inch longer on the front. So this will stick out a little bit from, like almost look like an additional, like it'll look like a fashion choice basically in the end here because I've made this color a little bit bigger than the green one. And I'm gonna fully finish this so it gets sewn together like a tiny pillow again, or like those cicadas we just made. But you can see there's one sitting next to the machine here. But again, just turning around my corners and I will slip stitch the opening left after I turn this right side out. I did not, however, make little additional cuffs for my sleeves for this. I should have, honestly. Maybe one day I can get back to it and do it. But uh, you know, at this point I was like, whew, nearing the finish line. I could see it, you know. I didn't want to do the cuffs as well. I am a lazy bean, I'm sorry. <clears throat> All right, so now I have my collar together. I can slip stitch this little area shut. And then I will just go ahead and actually, I felled this to the inside of this other collar, but just really quickly, not with like very fine, tiny stitches, with a little bit larger stitch, because again, these, this type of extra collar was meant to be removable and laundered. And it helps fill in the front of my collar where I have that ga gap anyway. Um, so then I have my false little lapels and little sleeve embellishments to make here. So I just took my pattern and like traced the shape of the lapel I wanted, um, basically. And I imagine I would put some of that same beading from the back onto the front of this as well. So I just kind of traced the shape, to, shape I want, made sure it didn't interact with the buttons at all down the front or anything like that. Um, and I would go ahead and cut that out of the silk. Again, I wanted to make sure that I cut that on the cross grain of silk so that it would stand out against the straight grain of the bodice itself. And then I'm making these two inch wide and like, eh, I think it's like four or five inch long, little like arrow kind of shaped sleeve embellishments. These aren't cuffs. They're just kind of like little doodads that went onto the sleeve. You don't really need to have an excuse to put more onto a Victorian costume. Go for it. <laughs> Layer it on. So this little arrow shaped cuff turn back ish things. Cut all of that out of the silk and then stitch them together again, just like I was doing the last few embellishments, just sewing the two layers together and turning them right side out. With a lot of, you know, clipping corners and turning things right side out with this nonsense.
All right, so here I am. My corners are clipped. My curves are clipped. It's time to turn everything right side out again with the aid of that little knitting, knitting needle there. You can see all the little tiny scraps of silk in the top of the frame here from where I've cut off all my corners and stuff. Technically, you could use those for like stuffing a pin cushion or something in, in the future. Very luxurious pin cushion stuffing. <laughs> And I have, how many pairs of scissors do we have in this shot? Wait, I just noticed. We have my paper scissors, we have two pairs of embroidery scissors, and two pairs of fabric shears. Wow, not bad. Um, so here I have my lapels pinned onto the front of my garment here, and I went ahead and tried this on to see if I liked the placement of them, and I ended up moving them up a little bit from the original placement. And then I just stitched them where these pins are down the front line here. I just slip stitched the lapels to the uh, bodice itself along that uh, frontmost line, and I didn't stitch them down anywhere else, which you'll see worked out just fine. But of course I realized, you know, I didn't have a collar brooch to wear with this. And a lot of times you'll see like a bar brooch used to close the top collar in Victorian bodices like this. So I decided to pull out my Fimo and go ahead and make one. I was going to order an actual Victorian antique one, but you know, these things are on the expensive side and it wouldn't have gotten to me fast enough. So I decided, hey, I have Fimo. I can make a cicada themed one to wear with this dress. So I pulled my Fimo out. You um, may have seen me work with Fimo and make little cicadas like this before. If you watched my hand fan video here on the channel, I will go ahead and put a card up to that video here. So you can see how I make these little cicadas out of Fimo. Here's a gold one I made before in that last video. Um, so you can see how I make things like this, but I was just making a little bar brooch um, with a couple of cicadas on it. And then I just made earrings to match because I figured why the hell not? And I pressed some glass beads into the Fimo, um, which apparently is fine because it came out all right. Because of course glass, melts at a much higher temperature than it is to bake Fimo. But I just glued some findings onto the back of the brooch and earrings, and I had some jewelry to match my finished day bodice for the cicada gown costume. Here is my finished day bodice, all complete, being worn with these skirts that I, of course, made last year with my hand fan and my bonnet that I made recently as well. Of course, I don't quite have enough hair anymore to do this uh, any actually properly Victorian hairstyle, so I've cobbled something together here. And then I also sort of dyed part of my hair green recently, which luckily at least kind of matches this costume, although is again completely anachronistic and inaccurate. But again, ac uh, historical accuracy is not my main goal. With costuming in general, I just like having fun and doing what I I like or I, what I, whatever I can dream of, basically. Um, so historical accuracy is something I consider, but I do not strictly adhere to. No bonnet? Kind of just looks like a mess without it, you know? And yes, I got home from taking photos and just threw my pajamas back on, so you'll have to forgive me. I'm still wearing my earrings, even, um, and I just 
took my bonnet off finally, but you know, I had to get casual again, take the corset off and all that jazz so that I could eat some dinner. But all anachronisms aside, I hope you enjoyed today's project. It turned out quite similar to how I had hoped, um, which was nice. I, of course, I still have a few like fit issues and a few little things I would change, but isn't that true of every project, of course. And then I do have one more project to do for this cicada gown project in total. Um, I have one more bodice to make. I'll be making a ball gown bodice next time. So it's a little bit more slight in the sense that it will be almost sleeveless and a lower neckline um, lacing closure instead of hooks and eyes, things like that. So I have one more bodice to make for this costume and then a new trained overskirt to go with that ball gown bodice as well. So we'll have a little bit more cicada gown costuming coming up here eventually on the channel. I do have a few other videos planned for in between that. Um, I like to take breaks between costuming because I uh, am too impatient to be doing nine day long sewing projects all the time. I, I need a quick turnaround. But thank you all as always for watching today and I will see you again real soon. Bye.